Chapter 12 Baldies Oh! Carrara clutched at Ross, her breath coming in little gasps, giving vent to her fear and horror. They had not known what might come from this plan. Certainly neither had foreseen the present chaos in the lagoon. Perhaps the broadcast energy of the enemy whipped the already vicious-tempered sulkers into this insane fury. But now the moonlit water was beaten into foam as the creatures fought there, attacking each other with a ferocity neither Terran had witnessed before. Lights gleamed along the shore where the alien invaders must have been drawn by the clamor of the fighting marine reptiles. Somewhere in the heights above the beach of the lagoon, a picked band of rovers should now be making their way from the opposite side of KYN ad under strict orders not to go into attack unless signaled. Whether the independent sea warriors would hold to that command was a question which had worried Ross from the first. Tino, Rao and Tawa in the waters to the seaward of the reef, the two Terrans on that barrier itself, and between them and the shore the wild melee of maddened sulkers. Ross started. The sonic warning which had been pulsing steadily against his skin cut off sharply. The broadcast in the bay had been silenced. This was the time to move, but no swimmer could last in the lagoon itself. Along the reef, Carrara said. That would be the long way round, Ross knew, but the only one possible. He studied the cluster of lights ashore. Two or three figures moved there. Seemingly the attention of the aliens was well centered upon the battle still in progress in the lagoon. Stay here. He ordered the girl. Adjusting his mask, Ross dropped into the water, cutting away from the reef and then turning to swim parallel with it. Tino Rao matched him as he went, guiding Ross to a second break in the reef, toward the shore some distance from where the conflict of the Salkers still made a hideous din in the night. The Terran waited in the shallows, stripping off his flippers and snapping them to his belt, letting his mask swing free on his chest. He angled toward the beach where the aliens had been. At least he was better armed for this than he had been when he had fronted the rovers with only a diver's knife. From the time agent supplies he had taken the single hand weapon he had long ago found in the armory of the derelict spaceship. This could only be used sparingly, since they did not know how it could be recharged, and the secret of its beam still remained secret as far as Terran technicians were concerned. Ross worked his way to a curtain of underbrush from which he had a free view of the beach and the aliens. Three of them he counted, and they were baldies, all right, taller and thinner than his own species, their bald heads gray-white, the upper dome of their skulls overshadowing the features on their pointed chinned faces. They all wore the skin-tight blue-purple-green suits of the space voyagers, Suits which Ross knew of old were insulated and protected for their wearers, as well as a medium for keeping in touch with one another. Just as he, wearing one, had once been trailed over miles of wilderness. To him, all three of the invaders looked enough alike to have been stamped out from one pattern. And their movements suggested that they worked or went into action with drilled precision. They all faced seaward, holding tubes aimed at the Salkar-infested lagoon. There was no sound of any explosion, but green spears of light struck at the scaled bodies plunging in the water. And where those beams struck, flesh seared. Methodically, the trio raked the basin. But, Ross noted, those beams which had been steady at his first sighting, were now interrupted by flickers. One of the baldies upended his tube, wrapped its butt against a rock as if trying to correct a jamming. When the alien went into action once again his weapon flashed and failed. Within a matter of moments the other two were also finished. The lighted rods pushed into the sand, giving a glow to the scene, darkened as a fire might sink to embers. Power fading? An ungainly shape floundered out of the churned water, lumbered over the shale of the beach, its supple neck outstretched, its horned nose down for a gore-threatening charge. 
Ross had not realized that the Salkers could operate out of what he thought was their natural element, but this wild-eyed dragon was plainly bent on reaching its tormentors. For a moment or two the Baldies continued to front the creature, almost, Ross thought, as if they could not believe that their weapons had failed them. Then they broke and ran back to the fairing which they had taken with such contemptuous ease. The Salkar plowed along in their wake, but its movements grew more labored the farther it advanced, until at last it lay with only its head upraised, darting it back and forth, its fanged jaws well agape, voicing a coughing howl. Its plaint was answered from the water as a second of its kind wallowed ashore. A terrible wound had torn skin and flesh just behind its neck, yet still it came on, hissing and bubbling a battle challenge. It did not attack its fellow. Instead it dragged its bulk past the first comber, on its way after the baldies. The sulkers continued to come ashore, two more, a third, a fourth, mangled and torn, pulling themselves as far as they could up the beach. To lie, facing inland, their necks weaving, their horned heads bobbing, their cries a frightful din. What had drawn them out of their preoccupation of battle among themselves into this attempt to reach the aliens, Ross could not determine. Unless the intelligence of the beasts was such that they had been able to connect the searing beams which the Baldies had turned on them so tellingly with the men on the beach, and had responded by striving to reach a common enemy. But no desire could give them the necessary energy to pull far ashore. Almost helplessly beached, they continued to dig into the yielding sand with their flippers in a vain effort to pursue the aliens. Ross skirted the clamoring barrier of sulkers and headed for the fairing. A neck snapped about, a head was lowered in his direction. He smelled the rank stench of reptile combined with burned flesh. The nearest of the brutes must have scented the Terran in turn as it was now trying vainly to edge around to cut across Ross's path. But it was completely outclassed on land, and the man dodged it easily. Three baldies had fled this way. Yet Jasia had reported five had come out of the sea to take KYN ad. Two were missing. Where? Had they remained in the fairing? Were they now in the sub? And that sub, what had happened to it? The broadcast had been cut off. He had seen the failure of the weapons and the shore lights. Might the sub have suffered from Salkar attack? Though Ross could hardly believe that the beasts could wreck it. The Terran was traveling blindly, keeping well under cover of such brush as he could, knowing only that he must head inland. Under his feet the ground was rising, and he recalled the nature of this territory as Torgal and Jasia had pictured it for him. This had to be part of the ridge wall of the valley in which lay the buildings of the fairing. In these heights was the shrine of Futka where Jasia had hidden out. To the west now lay the rover village, so he had to work his way left, downhill, in order to reach the hole where the baldies had gone to ground. Ross made that progress with the stealth of a trained scout. Hawaika's moon, triple in size to Terra's companion, was up and the landscape was sharply clear, with shadows well defined. The glow, weird to Terran eyes, added to the effect of being abroad in a nightmare, and the bellowing of the grounded sulkers continued a devil's chorus. When the rovers had put up the buildings of their fairing, they had cleared a series of small fields radiating outward from those structures. All of these were now covered with crops almost ready to harvest. The grain, if that Terran term could be applied to this Hawaiian product, was housed in long pods which dipped from shoulder-high bushes. And the pods were well equipped with horny projections which tore. A single try at making his way into one of those fields convinced Ross of the folly of such an advance. He sat back to nurse his scratched hands and survey the landscape. To go down a very tempting lane would be making himself a clear target for anyone in those buildings ahead. He had seen the flamers of the Baldies fail on the beach, but that did not mean the aliens were now weaponless. 
His best chance, Ross decided, was to circle north, come back down along the bed of a stream. And he was at the edge of that water course when a faint sound brought him to a frozen halt, weapon ready. Lokith and Torgal and Vistor. This was the party from the opposite side of the island, gone expertly to Earth. In the moonlight, Ross could detect no sign of their presence, yet their voices sounded almost beside him. They are in there, in the Great Hall. That was Torgal. But no longer are there any lights. Now, an urgent exclamation drew their attention. Light below. But not the glow of the rods Ross had seen on the beach. This was the warm yellow red of honest fire, bursting up, the flames growing higher as if being fed with frantic haste. Three figures were moving down there. Ross began to believe that there were only this trio ashore. He could sight no weapons in their hands, which did not necessarily mean they were unarmed. But the stream ran close behind the rear wall of one of the buildings, and Ross thought its bed could provide cover for a man who knew what he was doing. He pointed out as much to Torgal. And if their magic works and you are drawn out to be killed? The rover captain came directly to the point. That is a chance to be taken. But remember, the magic of the Foana at the sea gate did not work against me. Perhaps this won't either. Once, earlier, I won against it. Have you then another hand to give to the fire as your defense? That was Vistor. But no man has the right to order another's battle challenge. Just so, returned Ross sharply. And this is a thing I have long been trained to do. He slid down into the stream bed. Approaching from this angle, the structures of the fairing were between him and the fire. So screened he reached a log wall, got to his feet, and edged along it. Then he witnessed a wild scene. The fire raged in great, sky-touching tongues. And already the roof of one of the rover buildings smoldered. Why the aliens had built up such a conflagration, Ross could not guess. A signal designed to reach some distance? He did not doubt there was some urgent purpose. For the three were dragging in fuel with almost frenzied haste, bringing out of the rover buildings bales of cloth to be ripped apart and whirled into the devouring flames, furniture, everything movable which would burn. There was one satisfaction. The Baldies were so intent upon this destruction that they kept no watch save that now and then one of them would run to the head of the path leading to the lagoon and listen as if he expected a saw car to come pounding up the slope. There, there rattled. Ross could hardly believe it. The Baldies who had always occupied his mind and memory as practically invincible supermen were acting like badly frightened primitives. And when the enemy was so off balance you pushed, you pushed hard. Ross thumbed the button on the grip of the strange weapon. He sighted with deliberation and fired. The blue figure at the top of the path wilted and for a long moment neither of his companions noted his collapse. Then one of them whirled and started for the limp body, his colleague running after him. Ross allowed them to reach his first victim before he fired the second and third time. All three lay quiet, but still Ross did not venture forth until he had counted off a dozen Terran seconds. Then he slipped forward keeping to cover until he came up to the bodies. The blue-clad shoulder had a flaccid feel under his hand as if the muscles could not control the flesh about them. Ross rolled the alien over, looked down in the bright light of the fire into the baldy's wide open eyes. Amazement. The Terran thought he could read that in the dead stare which answered his intent gaze, and then anger, a cold and deadly anger which chilled into ice. Kill. Ross slewed around, still down on one knee, to face the charge of a rover. In the firelight the Hawaikon's eyes were blazing with fanatical hatred. He had his hooked sword ready to deliver a finishing stroke. The Terran blocked with a shoulder to meet the rover's knees, threw him back. Then Ross landed on top of the fighting crewman, trying to pin the fellow to earth and avoid that recklessly slashing blade. 
Lokith. This door. Ross shouted as he struggled. More of the rovers appeared from between the buildings, bearing down on the limp aliens and the two fighting men. Ross recognized the limping gait of Lokith using a branch to aid him into a running scuttle across the open. Lokith, here. The Hawaiian covered the last few feet in a dive which carried him into Ross and the rover. Hold him, the Terran ordered and had just time enough to throw himself between the Baldies and the rest of the crew. There was a snarling from the rovers, and Ross, knowing their temper, was afraid he could not save the captives which they considered, fairly, their legitimate prey. He must depend upon the hope that there were one or two cooler heads among them with enough authority to restrain the would-be Avengers. Otherwise he would have to beam them into helplessness. Torgal! He shouted. There was a break in the line of runners speeding for him. The big man lunging straight across could only be Vistor. The other, yelling orders, was Torgal. It would depend upon how much control the captain had over his men. Ross scrambled to his feet. He had clicked on the beamer to its lowest frequency. It would not kill, but would render its victim temporarily paralyzed. And how long that state would continue Ross had no way of knowing. Tried on Terran laboratory animals, the time had varied from days to weeks. This door used the flat side of his war axe, clapping it against the foremost runners, setting his own bulk to impose a barrier. And now Torgal's orders appeared to be getting through. More and more of the men slacked, leaving a trio of hotheads, two of whom Vistor sent reeling with his fists. The captain came up to Ross. They are alive then. He leaned over to inspect the baldy the Terran had rolled on his back, assessing the alien's frozen stare with thoughtful measurement. Yes, but they cannot move. Well enough. Torgal nodded. They shall meet the justice of Futka after the law. I think they will wish that they had been left to the boarding axes of angry men. They are worth more alive than dead, Captain. Do you not wish to know why they have carried war to your people, how many of them there may yet be to attack, and other things? Also, Ross nodded at the fire now catching the second building. Why have they built up that blaze? Is it a signal to others of their kind? Very well said. Yes, it would be well for us to learn such things. Nor will Futka be jealous of the time we take to ask questions and get answers, many answers. He prodded the baldy with the toe of his sea boot. How long will they remain so? Your magic has a bite in it. Ross smiled. Not my magic, Captain. This weapon was taken from one of their own ships. As to how long they will remain so, that I do not know. Very well, we can take precautions. Under Torgal's orders the aliens were draped with capture nets like those Ross and Lokith had worn. The sea-grown plant adhered instantly, wet strands knitting in perfect restrainers as long as it was uncut. Having seen to that, Torgal ordered the excavation of KYN ad. As you say, he remarked to Ross, that fire may well be a signal to bring down more of their kind. I think we have had the favor of Futka in this matter, but the prudent man stretches no favor of that kind too far. Also, he looked about him. We have given to Futka and the shades are dead. There is nothing for us here now but hate and sorrow. In one day we have been broken from a clan of pride in ships to a handful of standardless men. You will join some other clan. Karara had come with Jaja to stand on the stone ledge chipped to form a base for a column bearing a strange, brooding-eyed head looking seaward. The rover woman was superintending the freeing of the head from the column. At the Terran girl's question the captain gazed down into the dreadful chaos of the valley. They could yet hear the roars of the dying sulkers. The reptiles that had made their way to land had not withdrawn but still lay, some dead now, some with weaving heads reaching inland. And the whole of the fairing was ablaze with fire. We are now blood-sworn men, sea-made. For such there is no clan. 
There is only the hunting and the kill. With the magic of Futka, perhaps we shall have a short hunt and a good kill. There. Now. So. Jaja stepped back. The head which had faced the sea was lowered carefully to a wide strip of crimson and gold stuff she had brought from Torgal's ship. With her one usable hand, the rover woman drew the fabric about the carving, muffling it except for the eyes. Those were large ovals deeply carved, and in them Ross saw a glitter. Jules sat there? Yet, he had a queer, shivery feeling that something more than gems occupied those sockets. That he had actually been regarded for an instant of time, assessed and dismissed. We go now. Jaja waved and Torgal sent men forward. They lifted the wrapped carving to a board carried between them and started downslope. Karara cried out and Ross looked around. The pillar which had supported the head was crumbling away, breaking into a rubble which cascaded across the stone ledge. Ross blinked. This must be an illusion, but he was too tired to be more than dully amazed as he became one of the procession returning to the ships.